Backyard Professor Chess videos. This next game I'm going to show you is a very significant one for me personally. Now the information that I have on this game that I just recently played this last week is going to be realistically for those of you who are rated at 1500 and below. More or less beginner's information to intermediate. And here's why. This game I played against my Shredder computer app. And what it does is it adjusts itself to your playing strength. And I've been playing it for the last couple of weeks pretty heavy. And of course I'm losing 9 out of 10 games. As I'm learning how to apply the imbalances, as I'm learning how to read and interpret the chessboard and putting this information into my games, I am beginning to play better and better chess. I'm white, Shredder is black. I played this game at 1561, the absolute highest rating that I have ever taken a computer to, and I defeated it because of me deliberately creating imbalances and making those imbalances work for me in this game. Now, Shredder is opening with a Dutch defense, which, is, which means this is going to be one screaming battle. It always is with the Dutch defense. He's going to make it so that he castles real quick. I took notes so that I could describe to you and show you what I was thinking through this game and how I manipulated the various imbalances because this is an instruction-rich opportunity for me to share with you why I find Jeremy Silman's chess course so exciting for beginners like me because it works. Now here we have the dreaded stone wall in the Dutch. It's a very difficult defense. Yes. Now at this point I'm saying I have a very interesting choice. Here's where I come up with my plan and I deliberately create this imbalance. The imbalance of space on my queen side. I push this pawn instead of exchanging the pawn, however he would have exchanged. I push it forward, I have a beautiful positive imbalance of space. This decision affects my entire approach to the game. I now have a plan, and I have an a imbalance that is in my favor, extra space, right? So here's how I play this. I push the pawn to c5. I wrote my notes, so forgive me if I am a little difficult trying to find my notes because my handwriting's so bad. He's directly challenging my space. And, and this is, you know, this is typical. This happens quite a bit. But I created this imbalance of extra space, and I want to keep it. It's a positive imbalance. So I press my pawn to make sure if he exchanges, I'm going to keep this space. Right? That's what I want to do. He now comes all the way out to here. Now I played a similar game like this a, a week or so ago, and what I did in that game is I pressed my other A pawn up here to protect my extra space. Now look at this beautiful, powerful pawn chain. It's like a fence, right? I fenced in my space and territory, and he's got his fence. This is beautiful, but it comes at a cost. All of these pawns are on the dark squares. This means my dark squared bishop is my weak and bad bishop. Well, this game I decided what would be wrong with using my bishop as that pawn instead of the pawn. So I pushed my bishop. I develop a power, and I'm doing a very important strategy 
with a bad bishop that I'll tell you about here in a minute. He takes my pawn, which is welcome for me because I take his pawn there. Now, he takes this pawn, and I go right ahead, and I take that pawn with my bishop. Now look at the board. What do you see? This bishop is by definition bad. This is why you can't let a definition influence you so much. Just because it's a bad bishop doesn't mean, oh no, it's just a junk piece, I can't do anything with him. Wrong! I have moved him outside of the pawn chain. In fact, at this point, that's the strongest piece on the board. That bishop's stronger than that bishop or that knight, or the queen. He's the king of the board at this point. He's on an end of a beautiful pawn chain. He's radiating influence here and there. That's a great piece. Now, what does my opponent do at this point? I want to make sure I get this right. He does a beautiful move. He pushes his might onto his outpost. So he does a very good move. He puts that knight on the outpost. He's threatening my bishop, my knight. He's coming down here into my king side. He's influencing a good radiation throughout the king side here. I have good queenside space, but I still have a bad bishop. Notice in the process of me having a bad bishop on the dark squares, because of the nature of chess, how it works, he has light squared pawns, so his bad bishop is the light squared bishop. See that? That's his bad bishop. But I'm facing his good bishop. And I want to exchange my bad bishop for his good bishop. Anytime you can trade a bad bishop for your opponent's good bishop, that is always a correct move. And of course, he takes my bishop with his queen. Now, now I have another choice here. Do I want to leave that knight there? No, that knight's a very strong knight. The question is, this is the skill, this is where the knowledge of imbalances and how to read the board come into play. Because, look at the board. What do we see? We see a lot of pawns in the center, don't we? The center is pretty full. And what does that tell us? Automatically every time, in either a closed central position or a very cluttered central position, your knights are the pieces you want to keep. Why? Because they can jump over pieces. They're not stuck like this bishop I can't jump over this knight, this, this knight and pawn and move that bishop there. That's not how a bishop works. With a center clogged, the bishops have less influence. Whereas the knights still retain their full influence. It does make a difference in your game depending on how the board is on which pieces you take and which pieces you keep on the board. That can mean the difference between a won and a lost game, so this is critically important. Do I want to exchange this knight with my knight? Nothing doing. No man. No way. I have an opportunity to get rid of my other bishop and take out one of his knights, a valuable peace in this kind of a board setup. So I do so. He retakes with his F pawn. Notice this. The F pawn because it opens up his file. And his file is on my king side. Logically, geographically, because I thrust space onto the queen side, 
and my pawns point this direction, I play here. This gives him this side of the board to play on. Now, you don't have to let your opponent just play free on his side. Now, look at what I can do. Beautiful. This is what you want to do with your knights. I kept both of my knights. Another favorable imbalance. Queen side space. Now I have both knights and he only has one bishop and one knight, and neither one of them are doing a thing right now. So put him on the outpost. There's no pawn here that can come up and threaten my knight. There's no pawn here that can come to here and threaten my knight. This pawn has already gone past that point. That's a permanent outpost. That is what you want to do with knights. In the center, no less. Now, what does my opponent do? He brings his bishop out to a6. Absolutely excellent. He watched me do it. I put my bishop on the outside of my pawn chain, my bad bishop. Now, he takes his bad bishop. It's a horrible bishop. He takes his bad bishop and puts it outside the pawn chain. And notice what else he's doing. He's bringing his bishop threat down here to my rook, so I have to move my rook. Brings his little lady over here to queen to h4. Now look at the board. This is why reading the board is so important. His queen is looking right at my f2 pawn. His rook on the open file is looking right at my f2 pawn. His bad bishop that he moved outside the pawn chain, true, it's on that side of the board. It's way away from where the action is. It's obvious he's going to do a kingside attack, right? The bishop is way over here, but his influence is over here on the king side, and he's forced me to move a rook that was guarding my f2 pawn that is double attacked next to my king. Is it time to panic? No. I have to find a way to cover that f2 pawn. Otherwise, I am going to panic. Well, what's the logical move? Queen up. Now watch what he does. He brings his rook up to a7. <laughs> Now look at this board, will you? You got the queen coming down. You got the rook coming down. You have the bishop coming across. And now you got a rook coming up here, and you can see what he's going to do, can't you? He's going to pull that rook right over there and double up on the file and come after a kingside attack. This is a kingside attack in progress now. Is it time to start panicking? It's obvious what he's going to do. Do I now need to start bringing my troops over here to guard my king? Let me ask you this. His queen, his rook, his bishop, his other rook, has any of these threats, directly or indirectly, against my king side, has any of them taken away my imbalance of extra queenside space? No, they have not. Have they taken away my imbalance of two excellent knights, centralized no less? No, they have not. So what do you do in this case? You do exactly what Silman's chess course says to do. You continue making every move improve your position, and strengthen the imbalances that you already have, so that your game, little by little by little, becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So what do you do in this instance? I pull my rook out to b1. I see him having an open file. Well, hey, I want one. Silman says every additional favor.
favorable imbalance you can put into your game influences the whole game. So now what's he do? He makes another spectacular move. Boom! <laughs> he didn't just put his bishop there and leave him there on the edge. He's gotten him out of the pawn chain, and now his bishop is extremely useful. It's on a terrific outpost. He's not going anywhere. Great move. But here's the power of having the outpost utilized by my knights. Ta-da! I've got a knight here that I can take that bishop, which I gladly do. And, of course, he returns the favor by taking my knight with the pawn. Now you see the game is starting to thin out, but the center, boink, it's all right there. Boink. I take that with the queen. And you say, wait a minute, dude. You've got to guard the F2 pawn. Now you're not guarding the F2 pawn. And now his queen does take F2. Check. Now am I in trouble? No. Look. You have to look ahead of time. Here's what to understand. I have my 8th rank firmly under control. Right? Okay, so he gets a macho check-in. Yeah, he took a pawn. What do I do? I move out of check. It's that easy. Right? I moved out of check. So what's he do the next move? He brings the rook over to b7 and challenges my open file. I was afraid to weaken my 8th rank because of this. So I did not want to go up and take that rook, but I should have. Because I didn't, I failed to realize that my queen was covering this square. There's no way he's going to come in after me. So that's my error. That's my loss. What I did do was I directly took place, took my rook on f1 again, to challenge his queen and the open file. Now, he takes my rook, of course. He's going to challenge the open file, of course. So, I'm so concerned about covering my 8th rank because I exchanged the rook, but I have to be careful here because there's a possible back rank checkmate go on, right? Well, so I took the rook back, and now he's bringing his knight out. At this point, the game is pretty much even. Uh, I have a weak pawn over here on the A, and it's very interesting because as I looked at how more or less things are even, material is even, uh, the position is, is roughly the same, uh, I think, wait a minute, I've got some endgame insurance here. What if I push this pawn? Why not? It's a passed pawn. Granted, it's weak. It's a weakness. But on the other hand, if I start trucking that baby up the trail, that weakness can become an absolutely deadly power point. It will force him onto the defense, right? So start pushing that pawn, man. So that's what I do. Well, you always answer a wing movement, if you can, with central movement. So this is excellent. Now he's pushing his pawns. See, before, he has two weak pawns. He also, notice this, he has a piece here that's completely unguarded. There's weaknesses in his camp. There's weaknesses all over on this side. So, and that is my side. This is the side I'm still playing on, even though he keeps coming at me on the king side. That's one of the points I really wanted to emphasize in this video, because Silman does. Now, I don't know spit, and I'm not a chess genius. I don't have a chess IQ of 88 million, but Silman does know what he's talking about. And he emphasizes this throughout his books. Man, play where your strength is. So I have deliberately been emphasizing my queenside play here. I'm not starting to push these pawns and try to get something going. No. My power's on the queenside. Go to that side. So, 
I want to, uh, I want to change queens. I'm ready to get rid of the ladies. The more I looked at this, the more I recognized I'm safer with the queens off the board because I can run this little baby all the way out. I've even got my rook behind the pass pawn, where is where rooks belong. Behind your pass pawn and then push that baby. But it'll be a lot easier without the queen, so I'm willing to try to exchange the queen. Well, his pawn, e5, takes d4. I analyzed this and I decided, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and swap the I'm going to go ahead and swap the pawn. We're even with the material. I'm going to go ahead and swap pawn. And, and I might not have done that as strongly as I could either because now look what he does. He comes up here and takes it with his queen. Yeah, he's still got the file here, but now he's got to run in this way and you know, you kind of go, "Oh crap." <laughs> Did I goof up here? I can't. I can't come up here to a back rank checkmate. His knight's got this. He he's covered his eighth rank really well. Uh, I could push my pawn. The queen's threatening the pawn, even though at this point my knight is guarding the pawn. But my knight is completely unguarded, and by pulling his queen up, he can take my knight the next move. Well, hey, check this out. On further analysis, how about I come up here and go check? Not only go check, but I've got his knight covered and I've got rid of a weak pawn and there's another weak pawn as a target. What would be wrong with that? So, of course, he has to move out of check. So he does. Now the option before me, do I swap the knights? No, not yet. I want my knight on there to help me bring in my, my endgame insurance. So I'm not going to swap the knights. I take the pawn. I'm still covering his knight and his pawn. And now I'm protecting my knight also. So I thought that was a fun move. Well, he brings his knight up and threatens my queen. And I say, well, his rook is completely unguarded. I can keep contact. Notice how tight this is starting to get. Talk about a compact battlefield here, right? I can keep in contact with his pawn and his knight. I know he's guarded by the queen. My knight now is exposed, but his rook's exposed. I can come in here and go checkmate one move now. He brings his rook over here to threaten my knight now. So now what do I do? Well, I'm looking at this. I don't want to lose my knight. I don't want to bring my rook over here because that's too passive. That's just a passive move. I don't want to move my pawn because that takes him away from the knight, right? I don't want to do something passive, so what do you see? The battlefield is right here compact. Why don't I just come up here with my knight and take that pawn like that? Well, he pulls his knight over here to c6. Now, the thing we got to keep in mind is the back rank checkmate. We both are in danger of this. We're kind of stuck guarding our eighth rank. We, something doesn't look quite right. Something niggled at me. I'm going, huh. Huh. What do you do? What do you do? And it finally dawned on me, hey, ha! He gave me the knight. Knight. I can take that knight. And you go, what, are you nuts? You're going to lose your queen with his rook? No, he can't take my queen because then I can do a back rank checkmate. He takes my queen, I pop my rook up here and go check. The only thing he can do is bring his rook back and I simply take his rook and the game's over. And he brings his rook to d8. Again, he's going to try to get my rook, my knight. I'm thinking, is there a way that I can get a back rank checkmate here? There isn't. I can't pull my queen back over to here because he can just simply take her. And then if I move my rook, it doesn't matter. He can simply take it. But what if I switch now from this file? What if I pull my rook over to here and I cover the e8 with the, with the queen and the rook? Now I can end the game in a really cool looking sacrifice. A queen sacrifice. I can pop my queen there, he takes the queen, and then I rush in there and do a back rank checkmate. 
And then he spoils my queen sacrifice by pushing the pawn. You know, he's giving it luft. He's giving his king air. He makes an escape route. Dang it. Well, I'm not going to sacrifice my queen now because his king can get out. However, I can exchange the rooks, which I do. He has to take it because I put him in check. And now I bring my queen up here and I go check. And of course, he's got to get out of check. So he moves out of check. And I bring my queen up and I go check again, hombre. And he brings his king behind the little pawn island here to protect him. And I can come back here and put him in check. And then come up here and put him in check. And then he'll move back and then I can, we can come back and forth. But I don't want to draw this game. I'm winning this game. I, I want to win this game. So, do you see what I've got? My end game insurance. That pawn. What's the best way to protect that pawn? Is get rid of that nasty queen. And what's the best way at this point to get rid of that nasty queen? Exchanger, of course. So I come down here and put the king in check. And I offer to swap queens. <laughs> yeah! And Shredder took my queen and then resigned. Because, of course, the game's over. Now I get to take the queen. No matter what he does, I'm home free. I get to go get my queen again. This game is important to me because, for the first time, I have taken a chess computer above 1560. It was 1561 when I played this. And I won. I won by putting together Jeremy Silman's chess course teachings of imbalances, of learning how to read the board, of understanding what kind of an environment knights flourish in, as opposed to, say, bishops or rooks. And I deliberately created imbalances. I deliberately made them stronger and I made as many of them as I could. When I first got Shredder, I couldn't beat it at 1100. And because I am studying the Silman chess technique, I just beat the computer at 1561. I'm making progress. That's my point. Now, if a moron like me a typical Joe Johnny public sort of guy with absolutely no chess IQ worth spit, if I can improve my game this way, then so can you. That's the point. I have found a system that is beginning to work and I am seeing the results in my chess. <laughs> and I love that. It takes chess from being fun to being really fun. In the meantime, I have a lot more information from several Grandmaster games that I've been working my way through who also use these imbalances because that's where Silman got his information. He didn't become an international master by ignoring the Grandmasters. He studied them for years and years and years, and he took the best information from their games put it together in his own system, called it the, the imbalances, taught us how to read the chessboard. He's teaching us how to use each individual piece in a specific given situation so that every move we make makes the game stronger for us. Thanks for watching my videos and happy checkmating and happy studying. Have fun. Chess is fun, I promise. It's even more fun when you can finally understand enough about the pieces in the board to beat your dad that you've never beat, or to beat your uncle, or to beat your aunt, or to beat your sister, or your mom, or to beat the guys in the chess club, or to even eventually win a tournament. So happy checkmating, and I will see you in the next video.